Biden may have gotten elected uh, because of uh, massive fraud. It's what it's looking like in Arizona and other states. I mean, that we're, that's another topic for another yeah. day. Uh, that's uh, but well, uh, let me he's, just say on that, Greg. Let me just say on that. He shouldn't have had a snowball's chance in the hot place of being elected. Okay. I mean, I mean it's got, he's been around fifty years that he's quasi senile. There should have been no doubt about the election. A Republican should have won, even Trump, who. You know, can't get out of his own way in some, uh, out of his own way in, in, in some senses. But uh, the fact that Biden squeaked through and made, you know, without notwithstanding all this controversy about the count, is just an indication that the Fed itself is turning the country uh, to the populace and to the left wing government interventionist status, whatever we want to call them. Uh, th this is just another consequence of this. You don't get away with this kind of crazy money printing uh, without, uh, you know, bearing the consequences over time. And I think that's where we are today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can ignore uh, reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of yep. reality. Right. There you go. And, and, and then, you know, it, instead of let them eat cake, it's let them eat inflation is what we, what we really have, which are the things that revolutions are made of. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is uh, just just think about it. Uh, you, every time they, they go up to testify on Capitol Hill, uh, I'm talking about, you know, Powell and the rest of them. Why doesn't someone ask them, how in the world is it fair to savers, which are the bedrock of a healthy capitalist uh, system? And, you know, ultimately prosperity comes from investment and real sustainable productive investment requires savings. Okay, we all know that. That's sort of economic 101, but how can they uh, justify basically savaging savers as they have for the last uh, 10 or 12 years? Uh, you know, they, they pushed interest rates close to zero way back in the spring of 208, and I calculated the other day, I think it's something like 175 months <laughs> since then, and there have only been five months out of that entire period in which uh, the um, you know rate on a savings account or a CD uh, even equaled or slightly exceeded the inflation rate. The rest of the time, 96% of the time, people have been earning on their savings and their bank accounts and their CDs, any or even treasury bills. You know anything that you want to keep liquid and you don't want to take the risks of being in the junk bond market or the stock market casino, just uh, re regular savings, which people should have that, uh, you know, that opportunity. Uh, it's been below inflation, uh, you know, as I said, uh, for a decade and a half running. You know, that's, that's a, you talk about inequity, uh, talk about uh, government oppression, you know that that's about as bad as it comes because what you're it comes. I mean, what you're essentially doing is uh, confiscating the wealth of anyone who doesn't really feel comfortable about jumping into the junk bond market uh, or uh, the stock market casino. And you know what what kind of system can survive that? Well, it can't because sooner or later people are going to stop saving either because they can't afford to save or because they know it's futile and, and then we'll really be in trouble. Uh, what should people, I mean, you're he hearing these awful things, just common people. I mean, I got to tell you, David Stockman, I just replaced, you know, two different uh, uh, sink uh, plumbing, not yeah. because, of, uh, because of inflation, because I bought the last two in the massive Home uh, Depot store. This is all you have? Yeah, that's all. We, we were having a hard time getting products. Uh, yeah. So I replaced the faucet so I wouldn't have mismatched faucets. I did it myself. And uh, But what should people do? Should they be stocking up on, you know, on parts, on stuff that's going to inflate or they can't get? Or should people buy gold? Should people buy silver? Should people buy crypto? What what should people well, do if, in your estimation? Well, I, I think the only reliable uh, financial asset over time is gold. Uh, you know, I don't think you should put your uh, your entire portfolio in it because it's very uh, volatile in the short run. But as a uh, you know basis of uh, uh, wealth preservation and as a insurance policy against the madness that we have raging in the financial markets and with the central banks today, that's the thing to do.
Now, when it comes to uh, goods, uh, yeah, I think these shortages are probably somewhat temporary. Uh, and so, therefore, just like uh, you couldn't find any toilet paper, you know, la uh, April a year ago, and now uh, they can't give it away, uh, I think these uh, shortages will resolve themselves. So, I, I don't particularly buy the stocking up idea. But I think okay. the one message out of all of this is the adults, so-called, in Washington running the show, both on the Capitol Hill and White House end of Pennsylvania Avenue, as well as over at the Fed, have no clue about what they're doing. They've lost all standards in terms of fiscal rectitude, uh, monetary sanity even, that um, you should recognize the system is broke, and therefore the stock market in, in especially and the bond markets are very dangerous places. There is going to be a reckoning, and it won't be a 5% correction. It'll be more in the 50 to 75% correction, just like we had in 2008, just like we had with the dot-com uh, bust in two, uh, 2001, and just like we had in the great meltdown uh, uh, of 1987 uh, when Greenspan first arrived at the Fed. So, um, you know, the, the uh, priority now is on preservation of the wealth that you have, staying out of the casino in all of its form, uh, stocking up on some gold in order to anchor uh, your uh, wealth and uh, portfolio uh, and get ready to ride out the storm because people who stay liquid, I mean, I don't think the federal government's going to default or anything like that. So if you own, uh, you know, one year treasuries or even 90 day treasuries, you're not going to lose the principal and you'll gain a little bit of uh, interest uh, in the interim. But when the system finally corrects, when stock prices come down dramatically, uh, when uh, bond prices for the 10-year uh, and 30-year uh, uh, bonds uh, normalize, then there'll be another opportunity to, to reinvest uh, at a, a rational, a sensible level. But today, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a uh, sucker's rally if there ever was one. They are truly looking uh, for the greater fool. And, and you look at some of these markets, and that's, that's exactly what you've had, including the cryptos. Now, frankly, I like the idea of cryptocurrencies, non-state money. I mean, that, that's the ultimate solution. But today, we have a, a financial system so corrupted and so toxically polluted by all this liquidity being generated by the Fed and other central banks that everything gets taken over by day traders and speculators. And so the valuation of these uh, cryptos, and there's hundreds and really several thousand of them, uh, you know, are out of this world. They're, they're not based on any kind of sustainable rationality or analysis. Uh, they're just, uh, you know, the latest and greatest um, uh, 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 the thing that's uh, rising and that people uh, are cha uh, tra uh, chasing. It's uh, a speculative mania. So cryptos are not the answer uh, to anybody's portfolio today. You shouldn't touch them, uh, you know, by a country mile. Uh, but someday when we have to reconstitute the whole monetary system, uh, maybe something like uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, currencies that are not controlled by the state, uh, or the central banks will be a good thing, but I think they'll be at a far more, uh, re you know, reasonable, rational uh, valuation than what we're looking at today. Uh, you know, when something goes from 5,000 a month uh, a year ago, as Bitcoin did, to 65,000 uh, in early May, and now back to 30,000 a day, uh, you got to be out of your mind to play in that game unless you're a, a, not even a day trader, but, uh, you know, a trader by the minute in the nanosecond, because that's the only way you're going to keep your head above uh, water and maybe make any money if you're lucky. But it's not something for the ordinary person who's got a, you know, uh, a living to make and a job to <laughs> uh, uh, do uh, and a family to support to think about uh, at all.
I, I was uh, warning people about when it was 60,000, 60, 58,000. I was saying, listen, I'm not an expert, but you could get monkey hammered. And, yeah. you know, that's... You know, that's 30,000 a unit from 65,000. That's monkey yeah. hammer. And so, yeah, about monkey hammer, yeah, because it happened in less than two months. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, when yeah. something trade changes by that amount, and, you know, if you look at the dollar value, I think it's important to look at the market cap of these. Uh, when it peaked, I think it was May 10, Bitcoin was worth $1.2 Look at it today, it's worth about $600 billion. Well, in that period, somebody lost paper value of $600 billion in, in uh, two months. Uh, you know, there, there are uh, dead bodies uh, along the way there. There are losers because not everybody got in at 5,000, yeah. rode it to 65,000 and think they're, you know, still above water. A lot of people got the siren song late, uh, jumped in at 50,000, thought they were making money hand over fist, and now, you know, are, uh, you know, sucking wind uh, uh, very badly. Well, look at all these uh, companies. BlackRock liked it at 35,000. Uh, yeah. Mellon Bank with 41 trillion in the management. Oh, they love it at 35,000 yeah. a unit. Yeah. Uh, Elon Musk, another 35,000 a unit yeah. guy. Uh, uh, Carl Icahn, uh, 85 year old corporate raider, brilliant guy. Uh, yeah. He liked it at uh, 50,000. I uh, liked Ethereum better. I'm, I, you know, well, I. Yeah, I know. The, the thing is, when you get a mania going, and this is a world class mania. I mean, this is one of uh, biblical proportions, as they say. It's one for the history book. The problem with manias is uh, everybody at the end succumbs. They get caught up in it. And uh, you know, that's why it goes to like an asymptotic peak uh, in the last uh, few months or uh, uh, quarters. Uh, things almost go uh, parabolic. Uh, everybody uh, says the rules have changed. They lose track of everything they used to know, any kind of standards they used to have, any kind of history that they were once aware of. It all goes out the window and people buy and rationalize. And then, uh, you know, the day of reckoning comes. We've seen it before. This isn't something you have to find in a musty old printed page history book. We've been through it in 2008 and uh, 2009. Uh, we went through it in 2000, 2001. By the way, you know, in March, uh, March 15th, if you want the date, uh, 2000, uh, the NASDAQ uh, sort of peaked, I think it was about 48,000. Uh, and within uh, 14 trading days, it was down by 33%. 14 trading days, people didn't know, that, you know, what was hitting, it was a cyclone. Uh, and then, uh, you know, everybody assured, uh, well, this is a, a correction, it was a big bump in the road, but now, uh, you know, buy the dip. Well, the thing kept going down for the next two years until it bottomed 84% below uh, the peak, and it took a decade and a half to get back to where they started. Th these are the kind of things that happen uh, when you get a uh, full-blown uh, uh, hair on fire mania going, and, and really that's that's what we have today. Uh, and there, some of my guests think are saying about you said the reset. Say, well, it'll be a, a reset. It'll be a repricing, but it's going to look like a terrible crash. It's oh, yeah. I mean, uh, a reset is just a pleasant name. Uh, you know, it's a clinical name for a um, you know uh, a crash of epic proportions, which you know we will have because the markets are so inflated that there's literally trillions of dollars um, uh, that are at risk. And let me just give you one example, which I think, uh, you know, your viewers will find startling. And, um, you know, people that are watching uh, your uh, uh, interviews uh, are pretty attuned to how crazy all this is. But if you go uh, prior to uh, 1987, uh, prior to uh, you know the Greenspan era of all this money pumping, generally um, household uh, assets, uh, and this includes housing, financial assets, and everything else, uh, were uh, about 5.7 times uh, personal income. And that isn't some kind of magic number, but it seems to be you know, what the capitalization rate was over long periods of time, you know, as far as back as records go, it was plus or minus 5.7, five and a half times 
current income. In other words, the asset value related to the flow of income, and as the latter rose, so did the asset value. That's logical. That's how capitalism is supposed to work. Now, today, uh, the ratio of household assets uh, to uh, personal income, and I exclude transfer payments from that because people didn't earn those, uh, the ratio today is almost 10 times, not, not the historic golden mean of five and a half, but 10 times. And let me tell you what this means in round dollar terms. It means that today, according to the Fed's own statistics, household assets stand at $150 trillion. <laughs> it's a staggering number, but it's right there and you know, they put it out every quarter. Total value of everything households own, stocks, bonds, uh, insurance, uh, life insurance, uh, uh, real estate and the rest, uh, uh, $150 trillion. If we were still at that steady state, stable, sustainable, historic standard, of five and a half times uh, uh, how, you know, uh, personal income, the uh, asset base today would be 90 trillion. So what we have out there is a way of putting a dimension on it, a way of sizing the thing, is a $60 trillion bubble uh, on the balance sheets uh, of 130 million people. Uh, in American society, but especially uh, on the top, uh, you know, five, ten uh, percent, one, five, ten percent that owns a, a huge share of the assets. And that's that's the dimension of the bubble, 60 trillion. That's that's the size of the bubble. That's what uh, these mad money printers have created because they have driven up the P.E. ratios. They have driven up the bond prices. Uh, they have uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, totally destroyed price discovery, honest price discovery in the financial system. And that's why you have uh, household assets today being discovered at 150 trillion when it really should be something more like 90. And when it corrects, uh, uh, it's not going to correct to the mean. Yeah, it's going yeah, to go, gonna go yeah, through. The, yeah, so yeah, 60 billion yeah. becomes maybe a hundred uh, yeah. trillion dollar correction. Yeah, yeah. In, I mean, just is that, think about is that, that. Is that your words? This could be a yeah, hundred well, trillion. I, I, don't, I haven't even thought about how big the correction will be. But even if it were totally just back to the uh, norm, you know, this 5.7 times, it would be a $60 trillion correction. And that's a pretty damn big hole in the bucket. You know, if $60 trillion disappear, it changes everything. It turns, uh, you know, the financial system and economic reality upside down. And yet, with each passing day, as they they keep to start to go back to where we started, uh, with their eyes closed and, and buying up four, five, six uh, billion of, of more uh, Treasury and GSE securities, uh, they're pushing that bubble uh, even larger. And, and at some point, it's just going to uh, reach its asymptote. Uh, it's going to uh, uh, collapse on its own weight. And uh, then Katie barred the door, as they say. Yeah, you're 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 saying uh, get out of the markets, get liquid, uh, get things paid off, uh, be prepared to to protect your assets, not right. it, yes, not leverage. Preserve, them. preserve. Don't preserve. get. You know, this is the last moment in time to be greedy or aggressive, or to be uh, you know, frankly, overly optimistic about the future because the future is being driven by the policymakers. If the people were in charge, you know, I would be more than happy to say, uh, you know, it'll be what it is. But the whole system is being run by Washington. The Federal Reserve is totally dominates the financial markets. As I said, there's no honest price discovery. You, you know, uh, people who are actually buying and selling treasury bonds uh, without the backstop of the Fed uh, would not be exchanging bonds at a yield of 1.2 percent. It wouldn't happen. Nobody would buy them at that kind of yield. But who's buying them today? Well, of course, the speculators. Why can the speculators buy them? Because the Treasury bond has been on a little bit of a rally here from 
you know, it reached about 1.65 a, a few weeks ago, uh, and it rally, and it's the yield has dropped all the way to 120. So if you're on 98% uh, leverage, which is what the bond speculators have in the repo market, they buy it, put it on repo overnight. Uh, they don't pay anything for the borrowings in the repo market because the Fed has pushed the short-term rate, the overnight rate, to zero or you know five basis point is what their actual target is at the present time. So it is a massive subsidy to day traders and uh, traders by the hour and by the nanosecond, uh, you know, uh, fast, uh, high, you know, high uh, frequency traders. And so, therefore, what you have today is a simply a wild and crazy gambling uh, casino in which uh, prices are being set by uh, uh, traders uh, that, uh, you know, have no skin in the game and no cost of doing business. And, you know, that's, that's what it's uh, uh, come to. Uh, you, uh, before we get to uh, your country corner, which I want to talk about a little bit, um, you've got a new book coming out. You slipped that to me in the pre-interview. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you can't give away your, you know, your deal, your ideas, but do you have a title for it? What's it about? Well, I, I'm sort of working. The working title is Washington's Infernal Inflation Machine. <laughs> and I'm basically trying to say that they're all culpable down there, the Congress, the White House, and the Fed. Yeah. Uh, between those three uh, points on the compass in what I call the Imperial City, they have turned uh, the whole economy into one big, hot, inflationary mess. It started in the financial markets, which are still, you know, in the nosebleed section of history. And now it's bleeding into everyday life, uh, you know, for the uh, hardware you were trying to buy uh, at Home Depot uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, so, you know, that's that's what I'm getting at. But I'm, I'm trying to say, one, the Fed is lying when they said inflation was low and therefore they could keep printing money. And number two... Uh, they were deceiving when they keep insisting that inflation is only goods and services and not the rest of the universe, including housing prices, which, you know, we're pricing everybody out of the market uh, for the most part, or uh, financial assets of every kind, including all of these manias out on the margin with the cryptos and the NFTs and the meme stocks and uh, you know, uh, the uh, FANG stocks and all the rest of it. And uh, silver is still about 25 bucks and change. And actually, relative to your inflation numbers, gold's kind of a deal at 18 and change, 1890. Yeah. I mean, yeah. silver's less than it was in half the price it was in, in 2011. Right, right, right. I, <laughs> sounds, sounds like a deal. Uh, okay, so uh, your, your David Stockman's construct corner, let me just get full here so you can see. This is what it looks like on the page. Whoops, wrong guy. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, that's what it looks like. Country corner. You see here America's twisted pretzel economy, monetary arsonist that works. I printed some of the other. Whoops, there we go. Some of the other uh, titles. I mean, listen, these titles in his writing is just like he, he you speak. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and listen, you take that's not you take very complicated stuff and you say, OK, here's what it means. Yeah. And uh, so if you get involved with his subscription service, that's what you get. And he is a prolific writer. I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is July 9th to July 19th. He's gotten uh, seven articles. He almost writes every day. Yeah. No, it, it, yeah, it's a daily service other than uh, weekends, okay? Uh, if the market's open, uh, we put out an issue and we cover the whole waterfront from what's happening on Wall Street to Washington to fiscal policy to, you know, international uh, uh, developments, uh, the whole ball of wax because you really can't trust the mainstream narrative. Oh, you no, know? you cannot. Yeah. I mean, I, they, they must hate you on Fox, and oh, yeah, I bet you never get invited on MSNBC. Uh, yeah. Fox puts up with the Neil Cavuto's on there going, well, that's not so. Well, that's not, well, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. come on, stop, yeah. stop, yeah. stop. I, I mean, this is what I like about it. I mean, you're just getting that just flamethrower, you just bam. And if, if you're in the way, you get burned by David yeah. Stockman. So you just, 
But watch out. Here comes the flamethrower of truth. That's you, David Stockman. Uh, I'll put the links up in the after the interview section on your uh, Contra Corner for your... Uh, there's not any free stuff there, but it's uh, it's what you hear. You hear this massively complicated financial system boiled down to something that even I can understand. It's like, oh, I got it. I get it. Helen Keller, water. Uh, so anyway, listen, thank you, David Stockman, for coming on USAWatchdog.com. And I really appreciate it, uh, you, uh, with the flamethrower of truth. Thank you very much. Great. Good to be with you. Thank okay. you.